His topic is Modigliani and Miller in Practice. So please welcome Stuart Myers. It's both a pleasure and an honor to be here. Uh, MM really did launch a revolution in finance. They didn't fully develop the revolution. Uh, the revolution had many champions, both academic and practitioners. But if you really understood Modigliani Miller, then you could, even in the 60s, you could see where the revolution was going. I can say that personally because the very first thing I did when I got into the doctoral program at Stanford Business School in the 60s, I won't tell you when in the 60s, was uh, to tackle Medigliani Miller. My uh, professor, Alex Robichek, got me a research assistantship over the summer and said, OK, you figure this article out and see what it means. At the time, the Medigliani Miller uh, paper was intensely controversial. And it was regarded as complicated. At that point, people weren't telling stories about pizza and thinking that it was obvious. It wasn't obvious at the time. But as you got into the paper, as I got into the paper, and finally figured out the essential idea and began to try to explain it back to myself, I saw that it was the simplest thing in the world. But one of those things that, one of those simple things that has consequences that go on forever, both in scope and in time. First, I wanted to review the practical implications of the original Medigliani Miller ideas. And there are many. Dick Rowe gave a quote from John Maynard Keynes that off, said, in essence, that often practical businessmen or practical business women who would not read academic research are nevertheless following in the footsteps of ideas uh, produced by theorists uh, well before their time. And that is exactly true of the Medigliani Miller ideas. They have some obvious, they have some practical implications that we now think are obvious but we're not. So I'd like to review the MM propositions, maybe give a slightly different argument about why they work, and then go through some of the practical implications of what they said. The kinds of things that companies do do today or should do today that would follow directly from their analysis. Second, I want to ask what's missing in the MM propositions. Uh, if the MM proposition started at a first revolution, is there a second revolution underway? I think maybe there is. Now, perhaps I'm stretching it to say second revolution, but I'm just trying to get your attention. Now, first of all, what did Medigliani and Miller actually say, and why do we believe they're right in competitive financial markets? Well, what they actually said was that the value of a firm comes from the asset side of the balance sheet and not from the liabilities. Their proposition one says that it's the value of the assets that are fixed and the value of the liabilities, debt and equity in this simple case, add up to the assets and you can't change the total value of the liabilities no no matter how you mix them up, no matter how much debt you have, how much equity you have, nor how you design the debt or how you design the equity. The pizza story uh, tells it perfectly. I was going to use that pizza story, but Dick Roll used it already. If you believe, oh, I, and I also mentioned to say, MM started from the proposition that the objective of the firm was to maximize value. Not profits, not long-run profits, but value, what the firm was worth today. Now, if you believe that proposition, you must also believe that the overall cost of capital is constant. That as you mix the cost of debt with the cost of equity, the cost of equity automatically adjusts to keep the overall average constant. So just, I'll show you an application of that formula in just a minute. 
But first I want to go back and ask, why do we believe that the Midigati Miller formula, this proposition on the screen in front of you, actually works? Why do we believe it? Well, let me try another analogy. Uh, I'm going to tell a Medigliani Miller uh, martini joke. At least it's, you know what a martini is, in case you don't, in case you don't drink martinis. A martini is a cocktail that's roughly 12 parts, 10 to 12 parts of gin, one part of vermouth, and then you put in some olives or onions or something like that. Okay? James Bond drank martinis, you'll remember. Shaken but not stirred, although he had vodka martinis for reasons that I do not understand. So here's the Medigliani Miller uh, martini joke. What's a Medigliani Miller martini? Well, you buy uh, 10 bottles of gin, one bottle of vermouth, and a jar of olives, and once you've got those raw materials, the mixture doesn't matter. So now you're sitting there and asking, can this be right? If you went up to a bar and ordered a martini, would you care about the mixture? Are Midigliani Miller really saying that with martinis, the mixture doesn't matter? That the bartender doesn't care what proportion of gin or vermouth goes in it? Well, at first glance, it sounds like Midigliani Miller is saying exactly that. Because they're saying that the mixture of securities that you have on the right-hand side of the balance sheet doesn't matter. And that's like saying that the proportions of gin or vermouth or olives doesn't matter to the product. That can't be right. So maybe Medigliani Miller was saying something more subtle. And I think in terms of martinis, the argument would go something like this, that the suppliers of martinis have an economic incentive to mix it correctly. And mixing correctly means to produce a product that's appealing to the people who want it. Second, that competition will force them to mix the martinis correctly. Because if they don't, if one bartender mixes the martini in a random way, some other bartender is going to get the business by doing it right. Third, that if the bartenders don't mix the martinis properly, their customers will do it for them. You and I can mix a martini pretty easily. And finally, in the end, after competition works everything out, the, the customers are going to end up paying for the costs of mixing the martinis, but nothing more. Now, it may kind of cost you 10 cents or a quarter to mix a martini, and it's perfectly fair to pay that amount as a customer, because that's a real cost of doing business. But you're not going to pay more. First of all, competition won't allow uh, martini providers to charge more. And second, if they tried, you would do it yourself. Now let's go back to the Medigliani Miller argument. If you think of the right-hand side of this balance sheet, the financing side of the balance sheet, think of that as the end product of taking the raw materials, which are the assets and earnings of the company, and mixing them up in different packages to appeal to different kinds of investors. So the packages, the mixing algorithm could be simple, more debt, less equity, or it could be let's use some convertible debt and some regular debt together, or perhaps we'll do a mixture of short-term debt and long-term debt, or perhaps a mixture of debt in different currencies, all kinds of uh, intermediate uh, combinations. The number of securities that you can create is almost endless. Because after all, it's just paper. So a steel company faces real costs if it wanted to uh, restructure its assets. But if it wanted to restructure its liabilities, the costs are pretty small compared to the value of the assets. Now with that in mind, let's go through again the Medigliani Miller argument. It's the same argument. Corporations want to arrange their financing to appeal to the customers who are investors. Therefore, they have an economic incentive to provide the mix of securities that their customers want. Second, there's competition among suppliers of securities. So if a particular firm supplies securities that investors 
don't want or find it inconvenient to hold, somebody else is going to step in and do it better. Third, if corporations don't supply the right mix of securities, then investors or financial intermediaries will step in and do it themselves, just as you and I could mix our own martinis if, uh, if we wanted to. And in the end, customers end up having the securities they want and paying for the costs of creating the securities they want, but not paying any more than the costs of creating the securities they want because in comp competitive markets, you don't get free lunches. Finally, remember the, remember the Medigliani, the key is empirical assumption or factual assumption that makes Medigliani with Miller work. The cost of creating new securities or different mixes of securities is very small in modern financial markets relative to the value of the real assets and operations of the corporation. So investors may very well be paying something extra for the securities that they want, the mix of securities they want, but it's going to be very small. That means that most of the value must come from the assets and operations of the company and not from the mix of financing. Okay, so suppose we test this idea. A good place to test it is to think about financial innovation. Now, if you had the simple view of the MM proposition that it, the mix of security simply doesn't matter, then finance, there'd be no reason to have financial innovation. If no mix of security is any better than any other, if eight slices are just as good as four, then nobody would ever care how the pizza was sliced and nobody would ever go to the trouble of creating new securities. That's not right. But the MM propositions are not a law of nature. You know, you could think of the MM propositions as something like the law of conservation of energy in physics. It just says that things add up. But the physical law is true all the time. Economic laws are not like that. The MM propositions are like a law of conservation of value. And there's no reason to think that that law holds at every instant in time. Economic laws work differently. They merely say that it, the law is an end result once competition works itself out, and when conditions change and violate the law, it's temporary because the violation of the law will create profit opportunities which uh, erase the, uh, the, the profit opportunity. Uh, I'm sorry, create a supply response which will erase the, the profit opportunity. And that's exactly what happens in finance. When somebody invents a new security or a new trading scheme or a new kind of mutual fund that's successful, that means there is a profit opportunity. That means there is a temporary violation of MPM. But then what happens? The supply response is quick and it's very, very large. So if investment banks, let's say, observe that companies can make money or they can make money by inventing a new package of securities, all the other investment banks are going to jump in the game immediately. Financial innovations go from hot new products to commodity products very, very rapidly. So paradoxically, innovation shows that MM is wrong, but the quick supply response to innovation shows that MM is right. You know, the subprime, the subprime uh, meltdown is an interesting example of this. As evidently, some financial actors figured out that you could take low quality home mortgages, package them up, and resell them to investors and make money doing it. That sounds like a violation of Medigliani and Miller to me, because you're taking a raw material that could be offered to investors as is and breaking it up into different kinds of mortgage-backed securities and making a profit on the transaction. Okay, suppose that the subprime market in its infancy was a violation of MM. Was there a supply response? 
Did everybody jump in and narrow the margins of profit from doing this? Absolutely. What went wrong? Well, it could be that the supply response overshot. That is, the supply of subprime mortgages expanded too fast and too far so that you're actually, in the later uh, stages of it, reducing value by trying to mix the uh, securities up differently. And of course, the other thing that happened is that we discovered after the fact that the assets backing these subprime mortgages weren't worth as much as people thought. And that's not Medigalia Miller's fault. Right? Medigalia Miller said that the value of the assets, I'm sorry, that the value of the securities issued against the asset added up to the value of the liabilities. Medigalia Miller gave no guarantee about what the liabilities were, what the assets were worth. So I hope I've given you a little bit of an idea of why people in my business think that uh, the Midiga and Miller composition is really plausible as a starting point for financial analysis. And that has several immediate practical implications. And by the way, these practical implications are implications I think that almost all sophisticated corporations would take without question, but they come directly from the Mitigliani Miller analysis. The first is that the objective of the firm ought to be to maximize the value of the firm. Make sense? I think so. Uh, most uh, financial executives will accept now that shareholder value is the appropriate objective for the firm and the objective that incorporates all of the factors that financial managers ought to worry about. Value incorporates not just current earnings, but future earnings. It incorporates currently held assets as well as growth opportunities. It adjusts for risk, and it puts it all in a single summary statistic that makes economic sense. So the idea of shareholder valuation really came from MM. Now, not exclusively from MM. You can trace it to the American economist Irving Fisher in the 1920s and 30s. You can trace it to Jackson very influential papers by Jack Hirschleifer and others. But it was MM, I think, that really pushed this idea and put it on the map. The second thing, or the second practical implications, is that you want to separate investment and financing decisions. If all of the value, or almost all of the value, comes from the asset side of the balance sheet, then the key, invest key decision is the investment decision. And you want to make that decision first without letting it get confused by assumptions about financing. This is absolutely a standard in practical finance now. You do the investment decision first, and you worry about financing later. Doesn't that directly come from the guy in Miller? Third implication uh, I put here was this formula E equals V minus D. And let me give you an example of that. Suppose you have to value a company or maybe a division of a company you want to sell or take over. And you do a discounted cash flow model. Well, you could, which, dis, which cash flows do you discount? You could cash, discount the cash flows that come to the equity interest in that business, but that's not, not how people usually do it. The way they do it is to value the business first and then subtract the debt. Excuse me. For example, um, you may have seen uh, elaborate discounted cash flow models that would value a business in a takeover situation or value a division of a company that's in play. And uh, the, pro the usual procedure is to take the after-tax free cash flow of the business and discount it at a weighted average cost of capital. Okay, but if you want the equity in the business, what do you do? Well, it's simple. You just subtract the debt. So it's asset value minus debt gives you the equity value of the business. Absolutely standard, absolutely straightforward, but you can see that it assumes Midian Miller, doesn't it? It assumes that you can value the assets, and you get that right. All you have to do is subtract the debt to get the value of the equity. Pure MM. 
Another example which I will pass, because I think Myron is going to talk about it, is default puts. If you want to analyze the credit uh, worthiness of a corporate debt and figure out how a corporate debt instrument is priced given default risk, it's usually set up by assuming or proposing that the value of the debt equals what the debt would be worth if it was risk-free minus the corporation's option to default on the debt, and that's called a default put. Again, it's absolutely standard analysis in the credit business, but it comes directly from Medigliani Miller. Maybe the most important point that comes out of the Medigliani Miller propositions is that there's no magic in leverage. And that means that in practice, you have to be very careful to watch out for hidden leverage or big differences in leverage that could give the wrong impression about the value of the business. So for example, if you're doing capital investment analysis, you have to be very careful about leasing transactions and supply contracts. So let's suppose that you're going to build a power plant that's part of a refinery. And you can build the power plant and pay for it and put it, its cash flows as a part of the overall analysis for the refinery. Or you can lease the power plant from somebody else. Have somebody else build it, you pay for it with a series of lease transactions over most of the life of the power plant. The business as a whole is going to look more profitable when you lease the power plant than when you don't. And the reason is that the lease payments become a hidden debt obligation that increase the leverage, the gearing, of the cash flows that you get out of the project and increase the rate of return on the project. As soon as you say it, you'd say, OK, what, how should we handle that? Well, we should analyze the project assuming that we build the power station and then later ask, would it be advantageous to lease the power station? We would, in other words, we'd separate the investment and financing decision. But it would be easy to be confused by the high rate of return of this particular project that just happens to have a lease arrangement for the power plant attached. Now, uh, I haven't said anything about capital structure. And all I will say is that it's always NM plus. You start with the MM proposition that financing doesn't matter, and you add something. And almost all of the research over the last 40 years or so, 50 years, has been what do you add and what difference does it make? The trouble we've got ourselves into, researchers and practitioners, is that the list of things that you can add is now uh, very long. It includes taxes. It includes information. For example, if there's information problems in issuing equity, that's going to affect the choice between debt and equity. It includes bankruptcy costs, which Dick Rowe mentioned. And I agree with Mert Miller that in most cases, those are small, but not in all cases. It includes incentive problems, agency problems, other market imperfections. The list could go on and on. All I will say is don't expect to arrive at any simple general theory of optimal capital structure. Capital structure is a conditional thing. In some cases, taxes will be the driving factor. In other cases, information will be the driving factor. In some cases, where costs of financial distress are very large, they will be the driving factor. But don't try to put them all in one form or they always get messed up. So I suppose the practical implication there is don't expect from me any ge simple general theory of capital structure. It depends. The only thing I can tell you is that any theory of capital structure will be NM plus something. And that's the way to think about it. OK, what's missing in the Medigliani Miller propositions or the kind of logic that I've tried to explain to you? Well. MM is really a theory of valuation. It's talking about what things are worth and what affects value and what doesn't. So a young student of mine many years ago said, came up after class and said, Professor Myers, I've got it. Finance is the theory of rational valuation. And I said, well, OK. 
It's a theory, yes. Is it rational? Mostly. But it is about valuation? Absolutely. Valuation is 100% of the game. So ML would tempt you to think of finance or corporate finance as the theory of rational valuation. I now think that's wrong. That's half the story. So what's the other half? I've only got five minutes or so, but maybe I could just give you a hint. I think the other half has to do with incentives and financial structure, of how corporations are organized for a financial way, and how that translates back into how they actually behave. Now, NM didn't really touch this whole, whole issue of incentives and capital structure. They may have mentioned it. Actually, if you read the MM papers, they mention almost everything. But they didn't do anything with it. The whole idea of incentives as being important actually goes back to Mike Jensen, the famous Jensen Meckling paper on agency costs, and later to Mike's uh, paper on free cash flow, which put forward the idea that, well, explained the dangers of giving corporations free cash flow that they are then incented, they are then inclined to invest. But I actually think the world has gone beyond that in ways that are pretty interesting. Medina and Miller is a case where the theory forecasts the practice. I think we're now coming to a situation where the practice is forecasting the theory. In the time I have, let me just skip ahead and give one example public versus private equity. You know, we talk a lot about corporate governance, particularly in the United States, and about the advantages of different systems of corporate governance in different parts of the world. And we tend to ignore that there's two competing systems of corporate governance that are operating side by side inside the United States, inside England and Europe, and I'm sure inside South Africa. And one system of corporate governance is called public equity, and the other system is called private equity. Think of those as two competing systems of corporate governance. Pretty obvious what the differences are. With public equity, you have the classic problem of the separation of ownership by dispersed stockholders and control by the managers. With private equity, there's no distinction. With private equity, ownership and control are combined. So let me just give you one example, actually two maybe, of uh, public versus private equity. The economic question we want to ask is, what system of ownership and control is the most efficient for the firm as a whole? And that, as you can see, is what I'm pointing to as the big change that Medigliani Miller and all, many of us who worked on Medigliani Miller did not appreciate. So let's take an example. We've got three businesses, a law firm, a mature operating business of a large scale, and developed commercial real estate. Like an office building, something like that. Which ones would you expect to be owned, which ones would you expect to be in public ownership and which ones would you expect to be owned by private capital? Well, how about a law firm? Does public ownership work for a law firm? Where the only assets are human capital that can move? No. If you're going to have a public corporation, the stockholders outside have to have property rights to something and they don't have property rights to human capital, therefore you almost always find that law firms are privately owned. On the other hand, if you have a mature operating business, there's no reason why it can't be public, as long as the incentives of the people who work there are reasonably aligned with the incentives of the, of the outside investors. And Actually, I think that alignment happens pretty well in practice. We may complain about ex instances of uh, corporate meltdowns like Enron or Parmalat, or instances where managers of corporations are taking out too much in the form of uh, pay or options or perks. 
But actually, I think public corporations operate pretty well, despite the fact of ownership and control. On the other hand, commercial real estate is almost always privately owned. Not necessarily by individuals, but, in, but by insurance companies, pension funds, but they're not traded in the public market, with the exception of REITs. And why is that? You know what? I think the reason is that with developed commercial real estate, there's really no human capital involved to speak of. And the reasons why you want mature operating businesses to be publicly owned is that you want to create a distance between ownership and control in order to give the people working at the corporation the incentive to develop firm-specific human capital. You can actually think of the act of going public as a commitment by the owners of the firm to stay at a distance and not intervene and capture the rewards to human capital that employees and managers are actually put into the firm. Let me give you the final example. Suppose that we take a firm over its life cycle and ask at what stages in the life cycle should it be publicly owned and at what stage should it be privately owned. And we'll start with a high-tech startup. What's the problem? What's the financial problem for a high-tech startup? Well, the problem with a high-tech startup is trying to figure out which of the high-tech startups are going to succeed. Which ones do you really want to fund, and which ones should be shut down? I, a friend who's in the venture capital business once gave me a proposed secret of success in venture capital. You want to know what it is? The secret of success in venture capital is not to pick winners. It's to shut down the losers before you spend too much money on them. You can't leave that decision to the entrepreneur. If an entrepreneur starts up a company and was given money from dispersed public stockholders, the entrepreneur is always going to be happy to continue to invest somebody else's money as long as there's any chance of success. Therefore, you have to have private ownership at that stage in order to sort out the losers from the winners efficiently. And that's, of course, what the, pri what the venture capital market has evolved to do. Well, the answer to high-tech startup is it has to be privately owned. But at some point, it has to go public. It either go public or be sold out in a trade sale. And the reason is that you have to give the incentives to the entrepreneur. You have to be able to say to the entrepreneur that if this high-risk business succeeds, and there may only be 20 or 30 percent chance that it will, you will have a high personal rate of return, and you will have the opportunity to collect uh, rents or profits or personal, personal compensation over some longer period without having investors intervene and argue after the fact that you don't deserve it. Okay, so what happens to a declining business? Well, in that case, I would argue that it makes sense to go private again. And the reason is very simple. When a company is healthy and has decent growth prospects, the incentives of the managers to run it in their own interests are pretty much aligned with this, what the shareholders want them to do. When a business is declining, managers don't disinvest when they should, for obvious reasons. So it makes sense for the business to go private at the end of its life cycle. That's sort of interesting. You take a cross-section of firms, going from firms that are all human capital to, to things like commercial real estate that are zero human capital. It goes from private to public to private again. If you take the time series over the life cycle of the firm, I think it makes sense to start private, to move public and to end up private again. Okay, let me sum up. 
Going forward, I think we have two pieces of corporate finance. One is the valuation piece. In that piece, we just want to hold on to MM and all of the developments that came from MM. I mentioned about capital structure, but let me skip that over. The second piece is what I call financial architecture and incentives. And the simple example I gave you is being public and private ownership. There are different ways of investing and structuring the ownership of the firm, which have important effects on how efficiently the firm operates. That's not to say that MM is wrong. It's simply to say that the architecture of governance and control and ownership varies, or should vary, with the type of the firm and its life cycle. That's a first order thing that I think takes us one step beyond Medigliani Miller. Okay, thanks very much. <laughs>